And I think you've been here before. No? Yeah, this okay. is the first time. Oh, it is your first time? Okay. Yes. Uh, I'm a new postal um, from China. And um, working with? With Prashant? With Aita. Oh, with Aita. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, my background is science education, uh, especially focused on physics education. Oh, nice. Yeah. Right. Thank you. And I um, am not going to school here. I am an instructional coach. And you've come before. I have. Yes, I thought so. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, district. Um, right now, I'm reading this with this Um So you, you are our elementary person, correct? Mary, you're our other special exception, not in science ed. Um, I don't realize that. Diehard okay. pondering excellence supporter. <laughs> We've a, oh, sorry, Melissa. I've adopted you. <laughs> You're honorary science ed. Okay, okay so only about a half of the room is science ed. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, and, and since I know more of you, I know that we have a mix of faculty and, st and staff and postdocs and graduate students, and um, mm -hmm. that's exactly what we want to see. And we most importantly want to keep encouraging our folks who live beyond the campus boundaries and work beyond the campus boundaries. So I'm always very excited when we have an actual school-based person here. <laughs> Which so, is why the seminar was late in the day. That is yes. right. Yeah, the traditional time for this sort of thing is like noon with a brown bag. But um, CSET believes in the mix between getting that bridge between research and practice. So let me officially welcome you to Pondering Excellence, hosted by the Center to Support Excellence in Teaching. I'm Janet Carlson. I direct the center. And after that, I have little to nothing to do other than making sure we have fabulous speakers who help provoke our thinking. And we named this series three years ago, Pondering Excellence in Teaching, to encourage dialogue. And so all of our speakers are invited with um, the intention being they give you some research base for some things they've been working with, but they try to design their talks to encourage dialogue and pondering. And so I'm really happy today to have Florencia Gomez Zaccarelli as our speaker. Uh, Florencia has been a postdoc scholar with uh, CSET going into her fourth year now. Did okay. I count them right? Going into the third. Yeah. 14, 15. That's that. Oh, well, started at 15. I started at 15. Okay. All right. Um, and she has worked on both a science ed based project and she's now working on a math ed based project. And this is work from that first thing that really she did. Science ed. Yeah. So. I think without further ado, I will, oh, I forgot the little background that you probably want to say. Uh, Florence did her doctorate at the University of Michigan, and all of her prior studies before her doctorate were in the, um, Chile. And so she brings a wonderful international perspective to the work that I think often freshens our view. I appreciate it. So now, Florence, without further ado, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you so much uh, for being here. I uh, welcome you, and uh, I'm, I'm really happy to to be uh, the, the speaker today. Uh, it's a, it's an honor, actually. Like I've been in CSET for uh, several years years now, and I feel like uh, this is this is something that I, I needed to do at some point. <laughs> so uh, but today I will, I will be presenting on a multi-year project uh, that I've worked also for multiple years, <laughs> um, particularly on the study of uh, how teachers support discourse and argumentation in elementary science classrooms. Um, this project used video uh, in different ways, so that's why like, I put there like the idea of video as a tool for the study of classroom teaching, and it's also an interest that I have. Uh, and so um, before presenting about the, the particular study uh, that I want to share today, I wanted to uh, tell you a little bit about my interest and how that connects with uh, this, this study, how that relates with the study. So I have this. Um, so um, I'm an educational researcher and my interests revolve around teacher education, mainly in service uh, teacher education. Um, I'm interested in understanding how teachers learn teaching practices and enact them in their classrooms. Uh, these practices can be learned in many places, right? Uh, but I'm particularly interested in those that are learned in PD, in professional development. 
In the past, I've also worked researching teacher collaboration uh, and the role of technology to support learning uh, in professional development. Uh, but currently, I'm using video to study teaching practice in the context uh, of classrooms. Uh, so that's like what uh, I will be like highlighting today. Okay. Um, I would like to start like getting uh, you know some space here for you to talk and to share a little bit and connect with what we uh, are going to be talking about. So uh, I'd like to invite you to turn to the person next to you and share what do you think video provides as a tool for learning about teaching. If you don't know the person next to you, introduce. I think most of you know each other. But still. <laughs>
So what you're choosing to collect video yeah. on? Were you in the graduate student group? <laughs> <laughs> I asked if you were in the graduate student group. Yes. Um, I mean, like this situation is a is a particular approach to how to collect and use video, um, and there are many many approaches for how to collect and use video that reflect the brain. So the lens is in what you're looking for when you look at it. It depends on the assumptions you're making about what what is the issue you're looking for. That's the important point, like the lenses that you're using for watching right. and also for capturing video. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other comment? Okay, well, so I don't know if my list is going to make a lot of sense, but like I think some points are related to what you said. Uh, there is uh, the video is a tool that can help studying uh, teaching, research and teaching, uh, because it captures richness of classrooms. You mentioned like there, there's this richness that sometimes we don't even have access to, uh, like when the students are working in small groups. And so uh, through video, we can get uh, to know what's happening there. Um, it also provides a permanent record, so you can like watch it several times, it's saved, and so you can you can just access it like uh, all the times you need to uh, make different observations of the, what you have captured. And also, uh, it addresses a, a wide range of questions, so it depends on like, the, the theoretical frameworks that you're using, uh, the research techniques that you're using, how you can address uh, uh, questions in using the video as data. Um, and then another thing, it's like it records aspects of social interactions that a kind of server may not notice. And so just the, what you said about like not being that threatening because it's just like the machine of the back and not a person that's making notes. Uh, but also uh, because uh, you can you can watch it again, uh, like you know, not being there, it's, it doesn't uh, you know um, restrict you from observing things that are. Uh, in the video, and th that if you're there, you're not re necessarily capturing because you can't like, capture everything. Do yeah. you use a technology with mm -hmm. multiple microphones so you're actually capturing mm -hmm. many conversations at the same time in small groups? If we use it uh, for like the one of the projects that I, that I am working on, the math project, that like, we use that. We have microphones in different tables and videos, also videos. Mm -hmm. cameras and different so you're capturing so really much more than any one observer could capture. Exactly, yeah. It's impossible for one observer to do that, exactly. Yeah. Um, and then also, you can address research questions that are emerging and evolve over time. So sometimes you capture some video with, with a lens and you want you have like an idea and a question that you want to answer. But then as you're watching this video, other questions emerge and you're able to uh, use that video to respond to those questions, to address those questions. So it's, it's a tool that can help you address questions that will emerge in the process of uh, analyzing data. So like with this in mind and like uh, you know understanding very briefly like what video brings as a tool for research, uh, I would like to turn into uh, introducing you the uh, project that I've been working on uh, for these multiple years, <laughs> and uh, talk. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about the practice professional development program, um, and then. Uh, so I'm going to refer to the whole PD program and the research program, and then focus on a specific case study, set of case, case studies that uh, we have been conducting. So um, the Practice Professional Development Program is a practicum academy to improve science education. That's like the acronym. Uh, Weird acronym there that you see there, um, <laughs> and it's it's been a collaboration uh, with uh, the Lawrence Hall of Science at Berkeley. Uh, a team from Stanford University and also a school district uh, in California. This is like the list of some of the people who have worked in this project uh, over the years. Uh, the, there's also like older people that have been supporting uh, the project, but like these are the, the ones that have been like in the last years. And in particular, the the, the study on the case studies that I'm, I'm going to uh, talk about in, in some time. Um, we worked uh, as a team with uh, Hilda Borko and Emily Wright, which is here. And so this has been uh, a collaboration. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and, and so I'll be presenting uh, and also like representing them in this presentation. Um, so 
first, the project goal was to uh, develop and study a professional development program for elementary teachers uh, to engage and support students in uh, discursive scientific reasoning and using evidence-based uh, arguments. Uh, the whole, the Lawrence Hall of Science team developed an innovative professional development program uh, to support teachers and develop the skills. And uh, then the Stanford team uh, studied the efficacy of the program. So that was like the original setup of the program. Um, then uh, I would like to tell you a little bit about what we uh, use as our framework. And so one important thing for us is that uh, in elementary schools, there's sometimes more emphasis on the hands-on. So like the left side uh, on this, uh, table that we see here, this uh, graphic that we see here, um, and there is um, less on the development of theories uh, where the mind activates to develop explanations, so less on this uh, side uh, on the right. So argument is a central component of the link between what students learn in the real world and what uh, kind of uh, explanations they develop. And, um, the practice of science requires uh, this element to be able to connect these two sides. So argumentation and critique uh, uh, are in the space where, where we see the connection between the hands-on and the minds-on, uh, the investigation and development of theories and models that we see here. Um, often this link is missing, unfortunately, and we don't see that uh, students are uh, provided the opportunity to argue, to critique, uh, what they, they found in the real world uh, and when they are discussing and developing their, their theories and models. So, and, and we know that argumentation is the way by which scientists do evaluation. And so it's the main discourse tool for evaluation of ideas and that's why uh, it's so important to consider it and, and to uh, uh, science uh, uh, elementary teaching and learning. Um, also, we know the importance of argumentation in oral discourse and we know that it's grounded in the role played by talk in learning science. Um, we know that science talk um, supports, le oops, supports there. <laughs> uh, learning um, um, science, especially when it's conducted in group context. And so these are some examples of theoretical and empirical basis for uh, you know, the use of argumentation uh, and, or inclus inclusion of argumentation in science uh, teaching. Um, there's also another component to our model uh, that is uh, practice-based professional development. Um, we, there, research has informed to, to date uh, on the conditions for effective PE. Uh, there are like several conditions uh, that have been not named, like the five conditions that Desimone has uh, developed, and there's like another list with seven. Uh, but in general, these conditions uh, that have been recognized as effective uh, to support professional development um, help are helpful, but the, and they are necessary, but not sufficient for uh, change to affect change. And so um, the problem is that they are not specific enough to guide decisions. And so how do we go from these conditions? How how do we use these conditions for uh, developing professional development um, or designing professional development uh, if we don't have like more specific ways to use it? And so um, one uh, one way that it's being like uh, this this issue has been addressed is. Uh, through the use of practice-based professional development. And um, what this approach provides, offers, is that it situates professional learning activities in practice using uh, records of practice, such as videos. And uh, it also provides the opportunity to study practice systematically through these records that are collected and used in the professional development and uh, also in research about the professional development. Um, so, so that's why um, this uh, practice-based professional development approach uh, addresses the limitation that we see in, in the previous point. Um, so the practice PD program uh, is one example of a practice-based professional development program. And I'll, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the program so that you understand why I'm saying that. 
And so this program consists of three components. One is the Summer Institute, which is one week uh, during the summer where teachers are introduced to research-based classroom discourse practices. Uh, then there is a practicum, like two weeks, and where they can, or they have the opportunity to try, to try out what they have learned in the summer school, uh, uh, sorry, what they have learned in uh, a summer, summer school program uh, where students uh, are participating and they can teach those students. Uh, and then follow-up sessions. Uh, there are four days during the academic year one and four days during the academic year two. Uh, that are a full day um, to continue learning, to continue polishing uh, what they uh, have learned in the PD, these practices that they they are using during the school year, and uh, they are, they watch video during those sessions, those uh, full days, and and they uh, receive feedback from peers and from coaches. So that's like the basic uh, configuration, the comp three components of the professional development program. Um, yes. Are the follow-up days done on Saturdays or the um, days during the week and they have a sudden classroom? They were done on Saturday, yeah. For this specific project, uh, follow-up days were a full day during the Saturday. But that was also something that responded to the specific needs of the district. Yeah, we didn't have other time. Yeah, uh, so our research project, as I said before, um, was designed to compare the efficacy of uh, different versions of this um, of this PD program. So that's what we have here. You see that there are three cohorts. Uh, the first cohort A uh, went through the full PD Institute practical on the follow-up days for two years. Uh, the, then the cohort B went through everything but the practical. And then we had uh, another cohort, cohort C, that went through the whole PD Institute practical and follow-up days only for one year though. Uh, but like they, they participated in the three components and uh, that happened in, in a little like delayed time uh, after uh, the other two cohorts participated. And this was a revised version of what uh, cohort A and cohort B received. Okay, so just uh, uh, I need to give you that uh, reference for like a little uh, finding uh, explanation that I'm going to make. Okay. Uh, yes. So can you explain a little more the practicum? Mm -hmm. That's two weeks. What is it? Is that where they're? I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna, gonna talk. You're gonna talk. I'm about gonna talk about that. Okay. So yeah. So the the professional development practices that were enacted during this professional development program um, uh, are here. Like the the stable portrays like these key activities that the PD provided and are related to the components, uh, as you, you were asking. So all teachers had the opportunity to participate in presentations, uh, in modeling of lessons, uh, where they were introduced to uh, instructional practices, and, and they also analyzed those, those instructional practices in like, specific debriefs that happened after the modeling. Um, so, yep. in the modeling of the lesson, that means the teachers were participating as if they were the students in the lesson. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and so then after that, they, well, it also like stu adult students, like they, yeah. they were not well, like, you know, children, children, children exactly. <laughs> but they were participating exactly as like a, 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 a students in that, that context. <coughs> and then they had the briefs where they analyze uh, the instructional strategies, yeah. So um, several of these practices are, or these activities, I'm sorry, are practice-based and are focused on the type of activities that teachers use in their classrooms. For example, the modeling and analysis of instructional practices and the discussion of video from their classrooms. So that was connected to their, their actual practice. And you, you were asking me about the practicum, like what did they do? So in uh, the, the structure of the, the practicum was that um, teams of teachers will uh, plan together lessons and then teach to uh, uh, students in a summer school. So they have like a class and, and they, they will teach in the mornings and then they will, uh, as a group, debrief and watch video from uh, the, the morning. And it was actually like done by one of the teacher 
who picked a clip from, from the, the teaching that was done the day before, and then uh, they had like group discussion with with a coach. Yeah. So that was kind of like the, the format. Yeah, and not all the teachers led the lesson like every day. So it's like they were rotating. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if like, is that I mean I don't know if you want to say something about that. But, uh, that 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 was like basically yeah. Uh, what they did in during the practical. Okay. Um, so the research design for uh, the project, um, we had this central research question uh, of the project that guided our study of the efficacy of the program, and the main set of data was video, uh, video observations, and uh, we first conducted uh, an analysis on the, uh, these video observations. That was one day, a quantitative analysis of ratings. So to get to the ratings, uh, we developed uh, an instrument, a protocol, to um, observe and rate uh, more than 300 videos that we collected throughout the four years of the project. Uh, this instrument is called the SDI, Science Discourse Instrument, and uh, it, it was developed and validated by the, the, the team. Um, with that, um, so we wanted to answer these questions, these research questions. Uh, one, the first one was about uh, the extent, if any, does, uh, the, that the elementary teacher's participation in a PD program focused on discourse and argumentation in science influence flash on discourse practices. So basically, if there was a change, or if the teachers used the practices and if there was a change over time. Uh, the second question is what differences in student and teacher discourse practices, if any, are associated with teachers' participation in the practicum and not in practicum versions of the program. So we thought that cohort A went through the whole uh, program with the practical we uh, didn't. So we wanted to see if there was a difference there. Did you have videos mm -hmm. of the classrooms before? Yes, we had a baseline. Uh, uh, we have actually two uh, lessons as a basic baseline before they participated. Yeah. Um, and then uh, the third question was about the impact of the revised academic model, the cohort C, uh, and if it was different to the impact of the original model. model no, I'm sorry, that uh, cohort A uh, received. Uh, so those, these were the questions, and um, I'm going to go like a little quick about this because it's like details about the, the program. But if you're more interested, you can ask me later. But uh, so the participants was uh, um, who were uh, teachers from a large urban school district. Um, the uh, the teachers were elementary school teachers in grades three, four, and five. Um, and as we see here, like the majority uh, of, of the students uh, received um, or were eligible for free and reduced lunch. Uh, teachers had like an average like 10 years of uh, experience, teaching experience. And there were uh, some, uh, we see the numbers of schools and then the numbers of teachers, mostly female. And uh, there were some uh, changes in the numbers of, of teachers participating. So the numbers you see there, are the final numbers like with the you know like we started with a quite larger number of teachers and then attrition happened and that was like a big uh, issue uh, throughout the, the program. Um, but so then we recruited additional teachers for cohort C, and um, when we you know that the problem with attrition continued and it's something that is, seems to be fairly common in like large school districts, right? Um, then, uh, so we use this science discourse instrument, and I don't know if you have you have any knowledge about the SDI. If you know, yeah, some people know it, and so the the science discourse instrument was created and validated by the team, and uh, it includes uh, six practices: three teacher practices and the three students practices. Um, and um, so I'll describe very briefly each of them and give you an example. Uh, so for the teacher practices, um, we have uh, first um, ask, um, then press and link. Ask practice uh, is, a, is a practice where teachers usually uh, formulate questions, open-ended questions, uh, such as, are seeds alive? 
um, then in press, uh, the teachers may ask students questions to clarify uh, to, or to invite to provide more evidence, so uh, questions like that. Those. Um, then within LINK, the LINK practice, the teacher will link ideas and connect uh, through asking questions um, such as what's the difference between what one student said uh, and I mean, two students said, so something like as we see here. Um, in the case of the student practices, uh, they were explain, claim, how construct, and critique. And um, the practice of explain, claim looked for a student's ability to explain uh, and share claims such as uh, this one here. I think seeds are alive because they can produce life. Um, the practice of co-construct um, looked for students uh, engaging in, in the practice of saying that they wanted to add something or that the, they wanted to express agreement with uh, an idea shared. So uh, something like uh, what we see here. And uh, the practice of critique um, was, um, was looking at students being able to state disagreement, explaining the reasons and specifically making an argument where, for why the idea was wrong. So it was not only like saying I disagree, but also explaining why, because. So I disagree in explaining the reason. So those are the six practices that we included in the science discourse instrument. And it's and I, I wanted to mention this because it's, it's a big part of the project that we, we conducted, but also it um, illuminated and it was one of the references for uh, the framework that we developed uh, later for the, um, the case studies. Um, so we analyzed the classroom videos, teachers, uh, were the video recorded at least two times each year. Uh, there was the baseline, year zero there. So we have 300 uh, classroom videos, around 300 classroom videos from uh, year zero, one, two, and three in the project. So it's a big amount of video <laughs> that we rate. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, we analyzed the ratings. Um, the, the rating scale went from zero to four. Uh, for each of the discourse practices. And so we will watch the videos. It was actually segments that we selected for each of the videos and then, then rate them. Each video was rated by two independent raters uh, that will uh, like you know do the ratings uh, separately and then meet to uh, um, discuss the ratings and reach consensus if they were different. Okay. So rating yep. teacher did practice or the student practice or both together? Both. Both. Yeah. So like the instrument con uh, included the six practices and there were like the scriptures for each of the levels and uh, yeah, the raters uh, rate uh, the six for the six practices. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the findings for this portion of the study, just going to tell you uh, like what we found and related to the research questions. But if you're interested, we have papers and we can share those uh, with you. So the major findings, um, coming back to the research questions that I showed before, um, were that in terms of the impact of BD on classroom discourse practices, we found uh, overall that the discourse practices of the teachers improved, uh, of the the teachers and students in uh, their, their classrooms improved and um, this happened over time so there was improvement over time. Um, then the, if there were differences in discourse practices associated with practical versus non-practical versions of the PD, the answer is no, there weren't differences. Uh, we didn't find uh, a significant difference over the four years. Okay. And uh, for the third research question, um, the answer is it's a little bit more complex, uh, but we found that um, the impact of the original versus the revised model uh, was not, was not uh, present, like there was uh, no significant difference for teaching practices. Um, but there were some significant dif differences for student practices. Uh, and anyway, there was less impact for cohort C. So Are you comparing mm -hmm. cohort C with <coughs> the year one classroom implementation of A and B, or both years? 
uh, we were comparing uh, cohort A uh, and, and C, which were the cohorts that went through uh, yeah, but, they, but in different years. But yeah. cohort A had two years to implement. Are you comparing only the first year? Only the, the first year. year. Only the first year. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, that's true. Yeah, because cohort C didn't have like that extra yeah, time. Extreme. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, so we see that this is actually um, like what you know the this main question that we asked about the efficacy uh, brought to, and we we say that there was this difference, but uh, in the improvement of practices over the years, but uh, not uh, the answer to the other question was. Uh, that there were not significant differences. Uh, with this study, we answered that question about the efficacy. However, we were left uh, with some lingering questions, right? Uh, and specifically, uh, we had questions on the specific nature of the changes. So we, we knew, okay, there were changes. They improved. Like, how did they improve? Like, how did this is? Uh, you know, was an act in the class, what was the, the, the way the teachers enact these differences? And then also some relationships of the changes to the PD experiences. So as a complement uh, to the analysis based on the ratings, uh, we are currently conducting a small number of case studies to address these questions that we have. And that's um, what I'm going to turn to now. Um, uh, I say, well, yes, I'm sorry, yes. Make sure I understand. So, yes. So you had improvement mm -hmm. on the PD exercise. Yes. But the improvement was not did not correlate with the factors you initially thought, right? In terms of the, the practicum. Practicum and non-practicum. Actually, what I, what I said is that there was improvement. Um, what we didn't see was a difference between the cohort that participated in the practical version versus the non-practical version. So it looked like the same. We didn't we didn't find any uh, difference between those cohorts, but significant differences. Um, and but what we wanted to do with the case studies was to uh, describe, understand uh, what were the difference in when you looked at their classrooms. With the ratings, we have we have this measure. We were able to actually, you know, uh, assess more than 300 videos. So it was comprehensive. We were able to go through like a big number of teachers and lessons and years. Uh, but uh, we were left with the question: So what did this look like in the classroom? And so that's why we wanted to do a more descriptive study. Is that? Yes. Yeah, so, so, so it didn't look different in the rating, but maybe it looks different when you're exactly. And that's yeah, yeah. Because so basically, by uh, having the teachers do a practice run, did not have any effect mm -hmm. on which I thought. But uh, okay, that's what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. sure. Exactly. Yeah. Like we found with that this analysis that having them, you know, go through two weeks of uh, of practice didn't seem to make a difference, but we really needed to look at their classrooms, yeah. And to do that, we scaled down because, of course, it's hard to do it with too many teachers. So um, so that's why we, we uh, selected uh, STEM case studies. And um, so to not, I don't want to like bore you too long <laughs> for too long, so I'm gonna like introduce the case studies and then I'm gonna engage you to in, in some like video watching so that you, you can get a, like, a sense of what happened in, in the classroom. Um, do you guys have criteria for what how, how you ended up with the cases you did? Uh, like we have full data sets for these three teachers, therefore they'll be our cases. Oh, you mean like the selection of the yeah. cases? Yeah, I'm going to talk about that, oh, like how great. we selected the cases. Yeah. So just like to see to it, you like remember that we were looking at classroom teaching. We had the video observations as the data base, and we conducted the quantitative analysis, and we had those lingering questions, and we wanted to answer them through the analysis of cases. Um, and so we. Uh, the, we had these questions that guided our study. First, how do different teachers change their practice to enhance classroom discourse and improve students' ability to learn from evidence? So what, uh, you know, what were the, the different ways that teachers change? 
and uh, what features of the professional development are related to the changes in the teacher's practices. Those were like the two questions. Um, and, and we have some, uh, you know, additional theoretical basis for this work uh, that uh, is mostly related to um, like the idea of like classrooms being maybe uh, places where this course is author authority uh, with a large portion of IME exchanges. Um, that uh, we know that the use of interactive talk formats allows students to express their ideas um, and uh, practice the scientific reasoning in the classroom. Um, we also um, know that teachers can scaffold student discourse by modeling reasoning patterns. Uh, and so they, they can support the student by showing them how to do it. And also they can ask questions to help students develop their thinking. Um, so that, that was very important when we were thinking about like, how to analyze the cases. And, uh, and a fourth point is that uh, students move through a specific <coughs> learning progression as you. Uh, when they engage in scientific argumentation, and so they go uh, from uh, making claims, uh, later they learn how to support them with evidence, and uh, also using reasoning, and then they are able to make links and to critique and evaluate claims. So uh, that's uh, the learning progression that represents also like a hierarchy of, a co of cognitive demand, cognitive load for the students. Um, so here's what Jan was asking. Uh, the cases. So what we did was that we went through the uh, whole rating uh, data and we identified the teachers that showed substantial increases in ratings on, the, uh, on this analysis with the SDI. Uh, we looked for low to medium or medium to high. We didn't uh, really like look for teachers that didn't make any change. We really wanted to look for those that, that uh, showed improvement. And, uh, and so we, we had like a you know short list, and then we looked for participants that were there in the PD activities all the time. We didn't want to pick teachers who you know speak, skip too many of the PD lessons. So participant that they participated fully in the PD activities was important. And then uh, we ended up also uh, selecting teachers that um, t uh, taught in the same. Uh, grade level, so fifth grade level, um, to be able to have like similar population of students in uh, curriculum. Did you have anyone that went from low to high? Sorry, did you have anyone that went from low to high? Um, not really. That's what I was yeah, guessing. Not was really. It was mostly case. like this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, th this was like, like the most common progression. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, and, and so we selected four teachers, and today I'm going to show you a little bit of, of the findings on uh, the, the actual analysis that we did, and you'll see some of those names. Um, so the data for these case studies was a little different uh, to the data that we used for the ratings. In the case of the ratings, uh, we we looked through all the years uh, from year or time zero, the baseline through uh, year four in the project. And uh, because of the availability of the data, uh, here we only looked at the baseline year zero, and then year one of the PD, and year two of the PD. But in total, that meant uh, the eight lessons. And we looked at the whole part of the lesson. We didn't do segments. We wanted to be able to analyze the whole thing. So it was like about 40 to 60 minutes each. Okay, so um, now I would like to invite you to participate a little bit. And so we're going to watch a clip from before and another clip from after a teacher participated in the video. Um, I have here some transcripts uh, uh, before and after, like in uh, front and back. And um, a question for you to think about this clips as you watch. How does the teacher change her practice to enhance special discourse and improve students' ability to argue from evidence? Uh, just as a, as a help uh, in the back, the question is also printed. So if you want to read it again. Um, let's see. 
I don't think you can count milk as having grass in it. <laughs> but, Sap is correct that milk is a mixture. Anybody know what it's a mixture of? Peter? Water is the fluid from the cat. Oh, or any. Well, water is the fluid. And maybe some of natural um, fluids that we put in as factories to, like... Well, hopefully not. <laughs> no, it's essentially what it is. It's water and milk solids, and fats, and things that are, are mixed together, because we can get dehydrated milk, which is dried powdered milk, and... That's, that's the pre, the before Margaret participated in the professional development program, okay? And now we're gonna watch a <coughs> clip from uh, the year after she participated in the program. So remember that she went through the summer institute and then four follow-ups and then this is when we visit her. The people who are at the beach there, how would they experience the wind? They feel Where it. is the wind coming from and what direction is it flowing in? If you are feeling it. Sitting on that beach there. Jerry? Because if they're facing toward the water, um, basically, like, if they're facing towards the water, that's pretty much where the wind comes from because the cold air, I guess, goes towards the hotter air, and then it kind of goes like that. Um, like, if you were to be sitting on the land part, um, you can see the bar barrel goes towards the land, and it goes up. So I think we will be kind of going in circles <coughs> here. I don't, I think this might be correct, but if maybe like you're on the water, it might be a little bit, the air, well, the wind might be a little bit hotter. And when you're on like the land, the wind might be colder. What's your evidence? <laughs> That, oh, I'm sorry, Mia. Um, I respectfully disagree. I think that it starts, um, in this case, it would start counterclockwise because um, when you think about it, the sun would hit the sand and that sort of starts the whole process in a way because then it rises and then it cools down. But how would how would people sitting on the beach experience? Oh, the wind? would it be at their back? Yeah, it would be on their back. I'll give you like 13 seconds to, if you want to like look over, or like five seconds maybe. <laughs> over to the transcript and, um, and then we're going to share. Okay, so what changes do you notice? Yes, she's asking more than one student. Before she decides whether they've said it right or wrong, she's mm -hmm. letting them talk to more than one of them. Mm -hmm. In the previous In the second video. In the, second the video. first video was just with a, with a one question and a response, mm -hmm. and then yeah. more or less that's right or wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> the questions in the first video were more close ended, like that there was a right, a correct answer, mm -hmm. and so. 
um, it was more an IRE model where she was calling on each student and then kind of evaluating whether or not their answer was correct versus in the second video she was asking a more open-ended question and allowing each student to build on the other one's ideas. You couldn't see in the video, did she have a diagram on the board? That there was a diagram, to? yeah, I should have said that. Like they had actually draw a diagram of a well, cycle, yeah, of the wind, of the, and, and then um, students were looking at that and they were also uh, interacting with that drawing. So they will like stand up and make changes and like explain using the drawing. And yeah, so that's something that it's not this and there. That's why also I think she is in, in, you the, know, back. in the back. Yes, she's not in the front. So can she asked in the second um, video also what's your evidence? So instead of just evaluating, he was actually you know, asking the student, instead of saying you know, right and wrong, asking them to, to support their argument before she even you know, tried to evaluate it. It was really cute because she caught herself. Yeah. She's like, what's your evidence? And then she's like, well, what I'm trying to say, and then she's like, oh, my bad, sorry, Mia, or whatever the kid's yeah. name was. <laughs> like, she recognized what she was doing, exactly. and like that moment of like reflection was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah that's true. Well, so the kids had obviously learned the strategy of saying, I respect them. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was actually, right. yeah, and that's They're important. not coming out of nowhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, were, they were using this, like, sentence frames, and they, they had it posted, and, like, yeah, it was, like, a big uh, part of, like, you know, getting into the academic language, too, you know, like, to, to participate in these discussions. The physical setup also changed because mm -hmm. of the That's first video. Yeah. It was like everyone's dispersed and looking at the teacher. Mm -hmm. She's the focal point. In the second one, she's tucked in the back and the kids are a community. Yeah. And discourse is the center and they're supposed to look at each other. So the physical setup mm -hmm. makes signals to kids who they should focus on and yeah. who they should engage. Exactly, yeah. So like changing this, the, the way the, the classroom is organized and like how, where people are placed, like that's a big change. There was more evaluation, more like a IRB uh, interaction in the first video rather than the second, where they were like asking more open questions, like the teacher was asking more open questions, and also like opening space for like students to give their reasons, right, like to provide evidence, and, and also giving more space for them to talk, right? Yeah, did you notice like the length of the contributions here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the second video. So, great. Yeah, I think you captured <laughs> exactly uh, the changes. So, um, to now move to the analysis that we did, but for the case studies, um, let's see if like we can like you know have these ideas in mind and if it kind of makes sense. We were uh, going to share you know, about the, the findings. Um, so we, we conducted an analysis uh, with uh, or two types of analysis. Okay, uh, I'll describe them and and then discuss the findings. So our first set of analysis examined uh, the talk format, uh, which is that which was the percentage of time uh, during the, a lesson that uh, it was dedicated to different talk formats. Okay. So this included all the videos <coughs> from each teacher, so eight videos um, from each teacher, and so we, we watched and like tagged and uh, identified all this, the, the times where uh, there were like different talk formats enacted. And so um, this percentage of lesson time dedicated to um, um, the uh, whole group uh, discussion or interaction, small group, uh, pair work, and individual work. Um, for the whole group, we created a framework that helped us uh, understand how uh, the, the students and the teacher uh, engage in, during these instances of uh, whole group. So um, we, we developed this framework that has like this three distinct types. And um, we see that there was uh, instruction there. It was uh, non-interactive time and where the teacher is the one controlling the ideas. Then we identify teacher-driven discussion, which is interactive, but still the teacher is who controls the ideas. So whatever is discussed is, comes from the teacher's idea. And then the student-driven discussion, uh, where students' ideas determine the course of the discussion. So they, their ideas are at the center, they control uh, the ideas discussed. So uh, that was 
our first type of analysis, top formats. Uh, then the second type of analysis that we conducted, um, so after we have code for all top formats, uh, we selected one representative lesson per each time uh, for a finer grained uh, type of coding of the teacher top moves. And uh, we developed an epicurean coding uh, scheme that we see here that expanded up in our SDI, remember the science discourse instrument, uh, that included uh, parallel codes for support and invitations. So in the support is the teacher who does these uh, actions or enacted uh, practices, and in the invitations, the teacher invites the students to do it. So to give you an example, here we see that, for example, for scientific support, uh, the teacher will make observations or state of facts to show the students uh, how you do it, to uh, model. Yeah. And then for scientific invitations, the teacher will invite the students for, uh, to uh, make observations or to provide a claim, usually in the form of a question. Okay. Uh, so th this, this was like the other kind of analysis that we did. And when we uh, coded for top moves, you remember like one lesson uh, per each uh, e uh, time, so it was three lessons per teacher. Um, we also uh, looked at and wanted to code um, using a hierarchy, and because not all of these practices are at the same level, right? And so uh, we define this hierarchy in different level one, two, three, uh, where we see that in the uh, first level it was mostly stating facts, like making observations, like the first kind of like move that you can make. Uh, then move, uh, we, they moved to making claims, and they were able to start like supporting this or inviting the students to do it. And uh, in the third level, uh, it was. We see more, uh, more of these practices combined because they were relatively infrequent. Um, but we see that uh, give, give evidence reasoning is one and compare critique claims the other. Uh, so with this, we uh, <coughs> coded all of these lessons and um, some uh, patterns emerge and so some things uh, across the cases emerge. And so the first uh, thing that we found was that there was an increase in interactive talk formats for all of the teachers throughout uh, over time. Okay, uh, we see also that uh, there was an increase in student-driven discussion in whole group talk formats when they were all uh, discussing together. Students were driven more the, uh, with their ideas, the discussion, and then. Uh, there was also an increase in the cognitive demand of teacher moves. What was very interesting is that this happened uh, in different ways for different teachers. And so it's not, uh, uh, like, it's not that we saw like, exactly the same things happening in all the classrooms. Um, so Mark, I'm going to use uh, or like, um, provide you some examples uh, with, uh, from Margaret and Tamara's classrooms uh, because they instantiated each theme differently. So, um, do we have any question at this point? Okay. Um, for the th first theme, theme one, uh, interactive talk formats, formats. In this table, uh, we see the percentage of lesson time uh, spent in each talk format over the three years. We see here um, the predominant talk format uh, for each teacher during uh, each year is highlighted in a different color. Um, and here we see that Margaret um, started, uh, we, we see that she started with whole group instruction as the main uh, type of uh, talk format uh, present in her classroom. Remember the video we saw, like that was like very common in her, in her teaching um, and uh, was uh, a dominant uh, form. It was also a dominant form that whole group like WGG, uh, was a dominant form throughout uh, her participation, but we see a change at time one, like after one year and after two years of uh, her participation in the, in the PD program, we see a change uh, towards student driven uh, um, in discussion. It's like there's more control of students 
of the discussion by the students' ideas. Uh, this uh, large shift that we see uh, was sustained, but stabilized by the second year, as we see here. In the case of Tamara, um, her year one, um, so in her year one, we see a big change uh, because at baseline, she was doing uh, a lot of uh, instructional ball group instruction, um, and then that shift dramatically. You see the, the difference of that in the same uh, row, like from uh, 57% to 16%. And then it was uh, the, sh the shift was mainly towards uh, student-driven uh, discussion. Um, and then uh, by year two, we see that whole group is not as dominant and actually there is more uh, time dedicated in small group. And so um, she seemed to be experimenting uh, with changes in talk format uh, throughout the PD. We saw that because actually it's very really dramatic to observe the classroom from her first year to, or I mean, before the PD to after the first year in the PD. It's just like, uh, like there was a lot of IRB interactions in the first and a year zero in a time zero and then that shift completely and it was the students talking mostly in, in uh, the year one um, and she was also a new teacher she was in her third year teaching when she started participating and so there might have been like some experimenting also uh, because she was like in this first stage um, so we see increases in interactivity for both uh, but different classroom arrangement and different patterns of change over time, okay? Um, so now to uh, show you the second team, theme, I'm sorry, um, we're, um, we're going to focus only on the whole group top formats, okay? Um, when in whole group is important because uh, teachers and students uh, share the floor during those times and um, there is an important opportunity for them to, uh, you know, for the students to uh, have their voices heard, and um, it's also um, a, a time when the teacher can interact with the students in, in this particular way uh, and, and facilitate. So that's why we've focused on uh, whole group. And here we use a different representation to display the data. So I'm going to show you two graphs. Um, from the two teachers, Margaret and Tamara. Um, here we combined instruction and teacher-driven discussion because although one is more interactive than the other, it's still the teacher uh, that is uh, driving the discussion, so it's more teacher ideas. And so we see here teacher ideas and students' ideas. And this is how different they were in, in you know, like implementing and acting uh, the practices. Uh, and although going through like a similar uh, pattern and um, we see that Margaret controlled many of the ideas in whole group task uh, talk at baseline. Um, we see it like the blue line there um, and uh, students controlled the ideas more in the first year uh, of, of the PD although Margaret ideas were still there. Yep. She doesn't like drop that much, she's still like part of the discussion. Oh, the, uh, she's still participating. And the arrangement was kind of maintained through uh, the second year. So we see that there's a little more of a presence on the teacher, but students are almost the same, okay? And uh, for Tamara, she made a huge shift with the here. Like, students are <laughs> located pretty long here. Like, they do have many, like their ideas were not there, actually. Uh, and it was mostly the teacher. And then she shifts like dramatically and uh, you know lowers uh, her presence and students uh, you know, like uh, aument uh, or like increase in their participation. Uh, and then by the second year, they kind of like uh, meet a little bit in the center. Can mm -hmm. you go back to mm -hmm. the previous slide? Yeah. It's true that she drops the amount of whole group student driven, mm -hmm. but the amount of small group student driven goes up dramatically. Yeah. So she's moved over to letting the students do their work together in small groups. Exactly. Yeah, so they are still interacting. 
Because the, the fraction of whole group time in the classroom has still gone down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, but that's why, like, in this uh, graph, like, it's actually, like, it goes down, like, importantly here, because this yeah. doesn't show the small group. But it's import important to notice that, because in small group, they are still interacting. They're still, um, yeah. So it's, we're not showing that here because it's full group, but it's, it's an important point. Um, so for the third theme, remember like the levels that we have for uh, uh, the cognitive demand. So the theme was that we found increased cognitive demand. Um, sorry. Um, so we had this, these three levels in teachers demonstrated more high cognitive demand moves after the BD. That's what we found, and I'm gonna show you how they did it, like um, in the case of Margaret and Tamara. So for Margaret, um, the greatest change occurred in support moves. Um, this graph represents uh, that Margaret's support moves broken down by the level of cognitive demand. And so I don't know if you if you're able to see it, but like this is uh, level one here, and yeah, is that better? The so level one here, and then level two. And the level three is the darkest uh, purple. So the highest level of cognitive demand support moves were present at the baseline, as we see here. So she started with some uh, high level uh, support moves, uh, but then also that was in increasing over time. So we see that it increases. And, and uh, by the second year, it's, it's uh, bigger. Uh, in the case of, um, so in the case of Margaret, this supports uh, look like uh, something like this. These are some examples of how she uh, she uh, supported the students. So, for for example, for the um, move of linking to previous finding, uh, she will uh, you know reference previous investigations, and so she will bring those ideas to the discussion, uh, helping the students to make that, those connections. Uh, but also she will suggest new evidence to be collected and although it's in the form of a question here what she's bringing in is uh, oh why don't we do this why don't we try this and, and let's see what happens so she's modeling uh, that they can actually like go out of what they're observing and think oh what else can I do uh, so um, she's suggesting a new experiment in the case of uh, Tamara uh, her change in cognitive demand is, well, you see it here, it's amazing. Uh, like, um, so Tamara showed the most growth in invitation moves uh, at time zero, zero, around half of the, of the invitation were at the lowest level. You see, like, it, it's even more than 50%. Like, she was just like doing a lot of like IRE exchanges and like those questions. Um, and um, by the second year, we see a dramatic shift. Like the way, the times she, uh, in, you know, used invitation moves, uh, they were at the highest level. And then the changes a little bit by the second year. Uh, yes, second year, but uh, still, uh, it's, a, it's a large number. Um, so high cognitive demand moves. And then she continued yeah. to push down to level one. Yeah. Exactly, like we see that level two is actually like, yeah, yeah, growing here, yeah. And uh, how this looked like, uh, so she will, you know, make invitations to give reasoning, and she, so she will ask questions in that line, um, and the students were the ones who had to come up with the answers, so she will in, 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 invite them to be challenged and to challenge the information that we, they were sharing. So um, this is this is what we found uh, with these teachers. You see that it's way more uh, detailed and it's way more uh, descriptive than only having the ratings. Like we knew, it's it's a great finding that all teachers improve. But how do they? <coughs> it's a it's a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah the literature generally says you need more than the one week workshop. So what do you think was the critical element mm -hmm. in why these teachers took up so much mm -hmm. of what happened in yeah. that workshop? That's a great question and actually it relates uh, to the finding of 
uh, you know, non difference between practicum and non practicum. The follow ups, the day, the full days that they had throughout two years after participating in the summer institute seem to have like, a big impact. Those instances uh, offer the teacher opportunity to um, share reflect the, re and reflect on their own uh, classroom <coughs> teaching. And so it was very, it seemed to be very powerful that for them to be able to bring a video clip and to share it with their peers that something that was happening in their classrooms and then having a discussion and uh, receiving feedback from their peers. So, and then going back to the classroom and maybe trying out something that they discuss during those times. So that seems to be very, very important. And, and I said that it, it influences in some way, like, uh, or it's an explanation for the findings about the practicum. Uh, because the practicum happened also in a context that was kind of strenuous for, for the teachers. It was not their classroom. Um, it happened also in group uh, teaching, and uh, it was like other students that they didn't know. Like there were many aspects that, although you could say it's an approximation, like it's a, it's a space where you could like rehearse and try out things. Uh, it's so different that. It might have been like because they had that other opportunity. Like it might have been like. That's the same question too. Mm -hmm. Did yeah. you ask the teachers? Did they find this something they wanted to do even when they weren't videotaping it for you, or is it that they changed it because they knew the tape was being taken? Um. No, it, I mean it's something. It's it's a counterfactual question because of course you don't know what happened when you didn't have the video camera yeah, but exactly the yeah. question is that from talking to the teachers mm -hmm. about how they felt this practice affected their teaching mm -hmm. were they very positive about the changes that were happening um, were they feeling good about these changes I think they were they were positive I I think that yeah I mean in there we, we also conducted several interviews and mm -hmm. service with them so we have that those data and the teachers in general recognize that there were like important changes. Um, the, there is less articulation about like what the changes were. Like they know, they they recognize that they got like ideas and strategies that they could use in the classroom. So like the concrete, you know, pieces were very important. Uh, actually, like. The, one of my last uh, slides is relationship to PD and there was a lot of modeling and debriefing in the lessons and so these talk formats and talk moves came up, not very explicitly, but they, they came up in the modeling and, and there were other uh, more explicit concrete activities that they were provided uh, with um, that uh, support student talk. Uh, such a, I don't know if you're familiar with the idea like now and like four corners of this uh, very concrete ways to have the students participate and like engage in this course. So they valued that uh, a lot and they valued the, having these strategies that help them to make their classroom more interactive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was wondering if in the interviews um, that you conducted with the teachers, mm -hmm. if there was a reflection on the, the nature of, and I think you said probably not, but mm -hmm. on the nature of the change, I'm just really struck by Tamara's year one and year two. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I was trying to imagine like my conversation with a colleague yeah. who you know said, yeah, I did this great PD and I did all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And now I've got this particular group of kids. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, the, I'm trying to think of the ways in which they would say, and so therefore I've, I've I had to make some adjustments in my instruction yeah. or you know yeah. I found that this wasn't working right we got a new principal and yeah. that was so I was just wondering if, if you had any evidence from the interviews around how they were making sense of yeah. shifts between year one and year two yeah. specifically yeah we unfortunately we didn't ask about that but uh, in the case of Tamara uh, I think it's very interesting to see how uh, she got the message uh, that what she needed to do was like to give space to students to talk and so her translation of that idea was to step out and she talks about that that she realized oh yeah I was talking too much and it's, you saw the findings like yeah there was like more than yeah almost 60 percent of the time dedicated to the teacher actual talk and so um, 
and then and so her way to do it was like I'm gonna step out and I'm gonna let the students do the discussion and so it was a little chaotic and if you see that video it's like you'll see that like the students are like having this heated discussions and like and she's providing some guidance but it's mostly students like having the discussion uh, and she recognizes that and and then she she realizes that well I shouldn't have done that, that much like <laughs> I should like you know like go back a little bit and so she kind of re reinsert herself in the uh, discussions yeah yeah there is there is a little bit of that but yeah I think it would have been very powerful to have these findings at the moment of the interviews to yeah. kind of like maybe provide some you know like illustrations and maybe have them you know talk about that yeah definitely so, yeah, something interesting yep so did you notice any um, difference in the lesson designs uh, in terms of what they intentionally um, planned to do yeah, well, there was something very important uh, as a difference is that they started using the focal question. So they start, they in their planning, they, they put way more attention into what was the question that they wanted to ask and answer during the lesson. Was that addressed um, explicitly in the PD? It was, it was part of the PD, but also it was in the curriculum. So, yeah, because the PD was connected to the curriculum that we were using. And they moved to a new curriculum. Uh, the for the P no, it was the same curriculum that they, they were using, but uh, the PD team also was uh, develop the developer of the curriculum. So, yeah. And in what ways, if any, were there explicit references to the SDI within their lesson design, so that you could see if if we made any reference? To uh, no, like no, it, uh, sorry, the the instrument itself yes. has things. Yeah, the different practices. Yeah. So um, did. Did you notice that there were explicit uses of those um, strategies or phrases within a lesson design, almost verbatim did, transfer? Can I ask a follow-up? Can I ask a clarifying question? Yeah, we, we didn't do any analysis on the lesson design, just to clarify. Like we didn't, we didn't have access to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we knew about the like, the focal question because that was something that we captured. When so we were that was my curiosity in terms yeah. of as their designing a lesson, are they going through an approximation, thinking about what sort of discourse they want to have no. so that they're all... No, okay. no. Gotcha. no. And they were using a camp sort of curriculum. Like, a curriculum was already pretty well defined, yeah. and so teachers yeah. weren't writing their own lessons. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. they have. They use false. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Important topic. I know exactly what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. don't yeah. think they were yeah. writing lesson, a lot of lesson plans for this. Okay. So. No, no. And the, the focal question came from the curriculum. So in some cases, they, they did adjustments to the question, uh, and it was something that was discussed in the full day PD, like, because what, they will like think about this lesson that they wanted to make. They planned together, and so uh, they may they have made uh, adjustments to the question. So just to, well, we're finishing, but like I would like to leave some time, a couple of minutes for qu more questions, but you know, just uh, to finish, like um, we, we saw that uh, there was an improvement of classroom science discourse that can be achieved through different means, and so we, we, we saw that um, the presence of interactive top formats was uh, like an important marker of that change. And uh, a student-driven whole class discussion also like represented how this uh, classrooms improved in their science discourse, and uh, also a high cognitive demand uh, that teachers use in their support and limitation rooms. Uh, but we also saw that individual teachers change in different ways, and it's very hard to see that with just like ratings. We need to, you need to like go deep and like do this fine grain analysis to be able to understand how. Uh, those changes are enacted, or like what that means, what those changes mean. And it's a challenge, we think, for PD programs uh, helping teachers find ways to play an active role in their discussion while at the same time maintaining the space for students' ideas and voices. Uh, we saw that there was that, you know, kind of like a challenge on the balance. And in the case of Tamara, it's very <laughs> but um, yeah, and so that's also like a challenge for PD programs. And uh, another thing that's not there, but it's very, it's been like very striking is that um, like the level of explicitness, uh, you know, that by which this uh, practices and this 
uh, moves are discussed in the PD, uh, since you also have the fact, uh, like how the, the teachers articulate the things that they are learning, if they are not mentioned or like discussed. Yeah, so I don't know if you have more questions, please feel free. <laughs> um, any comments or? <laughs> Yes, please. Yes. <laughs> um, so course. it was part of the PD um, uh, looking at their year zero instruction and using the SDI so that they were uh, looking for. Okay. No, it was all separated from the PD uh, yeah, implementation. It was like a study that we did you know, independently. Yeah. We pro we, pro we give some we gave some feedback to the PD team, but it was not used in the PD. So they didn't. There was no occasion in which they used the SDI to. Okay. No. I wonder. I wonder what the influence of that would be. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if they knew about that, yeah. Actually, it's a big question also at the level of the research designing. Like, and, and when you do this kind of like, um, you know, partnerships where you have a, a team working on the PD and another team working on the research, uh, how do you like make connections? How much can you? Tell each other. We were also looking at originally at the efficacy of two versions of the program, so we didn't want to uh, really like influence the, what they were doing. Um, and and only at the point of like doing the revised version, there was more like change. So yeah, that's that's a good point. Yeah. Has any of the work? I'm thinking that because mm -hmm. I haven't heard any of you mention it. Yeah. Done an analysis of the PD, and I'm sort of building up just question. Even if they didn't specifically mention the SDI instrument, mm -hmm. but if you looked at like how much time was spent modeling and teaching about apps, how much was spent on press, how much was spent on like, because it's in the meeting. Yeah, and then, I in the because you could you could actually design a sort of HLM yeah. um, model. model. With, Looking at the relative percentages of time spent on these moves, yeah. Yeah. and then what did it look like in the classroom? Related and what to did the it classroom. look like with yeah. the kids? Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. No, we haven't done it. Yeah, definitely not. But uh, now I know that wasn't actually the real, the original no. design. But the way the data is yeah. coming out, it, it kind of begs the question. Yeah, and actually, like, that's very interesting to mention. Now that we're starting a new, yeah, a new project like yeah we we have like a continuation of this practice project now uh, with another district and the idea is to um, support the district in implementing this model independently themselves so we're building capacity with the district and uh, seeing if it's possible to do that and with the same uh, curriculum with uh, with the same curriculum yeah same curriculum and yeah, but the idea you need like which oh yeah oh yeah no practical yeah, yeah. Summer Institute follow us. <coughs> I mean, we don't have any evidence that the practical matter, <laughs> and it's very expensive. You yeah. may imagine, right? And also, yeah. I was wondering about the practicum. Just like, what to what do you attribute that? I'm wondering if you think that it has something to do with the, being summer school and mm -hmm. the quality of the relationships that you have with kids in summer school. That's a big not really being relevant to the, yeah. the school year. Well, yeah. think about the trust you need in the classroom mm -hmm. to, have a, yeah. to do that discourse that's got heavy, heavy cognitive. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like doing that two weeks during summer. Yeah. yeah, I think I think also the practicum like based is based on the assumption that uh, you know giving this space for to to approximate uh, these practices in a like safe relatively safe space will, will be like positive and like will, models and all uh, yes <laughs> yeah that's true like you have the, that assumption and it, it has worked like there is evidence that that works well for like pre service teachers. But these are in-service teachers who already have access to classrooms. They're on students. They they have been in contact with these practices. This is something that we are starting to but entertain. But, but that's like, what we do in, in the Hollyhock work. Is they 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 are practicing teachers, and we have them rehearse in a safe environment before they try it out with their kids. But they try it out with, with their with kids other. later. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. 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 They do it with peers. And but it's different doing it with peers and doing it with like students. But it's still a type of rehearsal yeah. that might be more effective than practicum, which seemed to have no effect. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's an interesting. Yeah. 
variables. Right. We also have other variables. We want to learn about Polycock then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I think we should thank Florentia at this point. There's still more Very refreshments. There's yeah. time for informal conversation. Mm -hmm. So uh, I do so want to honor people at this time. Yes, absolutely. Can you give me your email? I can I have yours. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Perfect. Can you give me Good to see you. We have like days left on the job. Your days. Yeah, we should have been traveling. Yeah, yeah. Several weeks. We used to work with some of the teachers. I worked on the economy. So we had a science grant.